And we are excited tonight to have Jill Hoy with us. Jill is a fantastic artist who splits her time between Maine and Massachusetts. Her work is in hundreds of public and private collections, including the Portland Museum of Art, Harvard Business School, Boston Public Library, Fidelity, John Hancock, and Art in the Embassies collections, just to name a few. However, Jill is not here tonight to talk about her own work. Instead, she is here to talk about John Ember and our retrospective exhibition. She has unique insight into Ember and his work from a professional standpoint as an artist and from a personal standpoint as his widow. I suspect most of you are well acquainted with John Ember and his work, and we will all certainly learn more tonight from Jill. But just to acquaint you with our retrospective if you've not already seen it, the exhibition includes all of Ember's evolving styles and subject matter, from his earliest figurative paintings and portraits in the 1980s, to his studio and plein air landscapes from the 1990s, to his later nearly abstract work from the 2000s and on. And the exhibition ends with the poignant goodbye portraits for family and friends he made in the years leading up to his premature death of ALS in April of 2014. Ember's work is in museums throughout the country, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Harvard's Fogg Museum, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the De Cordova Museum, the Farnsworth Museum of Art, the Danforth Museum, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, the Davis Museum at Wellesley, and the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis. He was a subject of a 2004 retrospective at the Godwin Turnbach Museum at Queens College in New York. If you've not yet seen it, I highly recommend the film Ember's Left Hand, which beautifully and movingly captures Ember's perseverance and spirit in the face of ALS. With that, I turn things over to Jill Hoyen. Thank you. Thank you, John and Kelly. Um, this is a beautiful picture of John Ember in the 70s. He was born in Baldwin, New York, brought up Long Island with his sister who was four years older than him. And these are, we're going to pan back a little bit on this beautiful photograph so you see the whole thing, which is his studio in Somerville on Walnut Street. Um, he studied with, well, he grew up in Long Island, popping in and out of New York with his best friend, Phil Allen. Um, and I think having dialogues with certain painters throughout his life have been very important. Phil Allen being one, David DeSalvo another, Jill Hoy being another. Um, this was his seminal studio I think during the BU years studying with Gustin and afterwards. He loved Somerville. He moved there because his sister had moved to Cambridge and um, he was an art mover moving in and out of great um, collections in New York and later working at the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard. But he applied to BU because Philip Gustin was there. And Gustin, in perusing the applicants, saw his work and said, get me that man. And um, they were very close. And Gustin was a, he, he died in 19, 1980, Gustin, Philip Gustin did. And I almost had the feeling he had the prescience that he wanted to pour into John whatever, that John would be a recipient of knowledge and carry it on. Which, um, let's take a look at these little paintings that surround this one. These are studies and moving into what would become some huge paintings. You can see this one, scale-wise, it's a giant painting. John, it was the age of abstract expressionism and color field paintings, and everyone was doing big. You had to do big paintings for the New York audience, the New York wall, the corporate wall. And that threads through his life, certainly. These tiny little beauties um, were of family and intimacy. It was very important to Gustin to imbue in his students that you, you worked from your intimate knowledge 
of your social and political world, that you made it personal. Um, and John took that and ran with it to a quite an autobiographical, it threads through his entire life, the autobiography. Um, this is his father, and it came to look like John himself. Um, his mother and John, Loki, the dog, the Scotty dog. Um, the boy on the father's back, which you can see, as I mentioned, this unbelievable arc iconic painting. They were very archetypal and yet very personal at the same time, which of course archetypes are. Um, his sister. When I met John, he was involved in doing a painting of himself and his sister. And it's interesting to see these as I bounce back and forth through his entire life. So as we leave this corner, um, this is a, self, a late self-portrait done in the last year of his life, and it started out very comical and kind of vaudevillian, which, speaking of his family, his father was very borscht belt vaudevillian. His mother was quite an intellect and very serious, and so John kind of combined those two. Um, in his world and in his being. Very smart, very funny. Um, always trying to shake things up. And you'll find that in these, there's often turns and poignancy and deeply felt. This one, I always say, I wish I had the 40 paintings underneath John's paintings, because he would just work them, very self-demanding. And from that, almost caricature vaudevillian quality, it became this full moon, end of life, swan song. Um, done in 2013 with his left hand. Um, let's pivot to this side. Um, As I mentioned, John was a picture hanger for the Fog Art Museum and a janitor and was in the fog late at night <laughs> soaking in the great masters, which imbued his, he loved, West, he loved Western art particularly. And from the beginning, from the 14th, from the 12th century on through the Byzantium, Titian, Rembrandt, this one is Botticelli. And John is hanging it with his level in his back pocket. And um, <laughs> he had given it to Bill Corbett, um, who was a poet and writer friend of um, his, and John introduced him to Philip Guston, and a friendship evolved of all three of them. So, um, also, John's hands. He would distort purposely, um, and the hands, he had wonderful hands, so the, of course, many of them are his hands. Um, they were very sensitive, large, beautiful hands. And these oversized heads, you will always see on very small bodies. And um, the wild man, around this time, which is 1980, was introduced to his repertoire, like, as a doppelganger for himself. And often they had green heads, and they were doing funny things, sitting with a nude woman at a breakfast table, or eating, eating his morning breakfast, reading the newspaper. They didn't really look like him, but they were him. It was like his alter ego. Um, this one, 
of course he was very aware of all the artists. Um, but this is like a play on a Picasso that you probably all know, um, of creeping through, pulling back the curtain on the Sleeping Beauty and the sort of satyr bull quality of, a, of the male coming through. Um, it's called The Approach. And reading the morning paper, which both of these end up being huge paintings. Um, which I love in their corporeal selves. This one seemed very apropos of the moment, being in the darkness and reaching out, having the hand reach, the hand of God, um, in this case. I believe that's the name of it. And again, that searching. John was always on a quest and he was extremely courageous. Many people find a style and they stay with it. And John made quite a splash with these early on. He was quite young and the iconic archetypal paintings really, in their figuration, struck chords and he got a lot of acclaim for them. But a pattern that you'll find throughout his life, once he got something under his belt, he was off and pushing for new territory. And um, here we have In Bed with Sophia. John's ultimate woman was Sophia Loren. And so he, uh, there are various. Uh, hats off to Sophia throughout his life. Um, and there's this lovely little um, painting here of, <laughs> of course, relationships were always much harder than he had hoped that they would be. Um, and, you know, in typical timely fashion of the 70s and um, 80s, went through quite a few of them in search for uh, his soulmate. So this is his ideal soul. Um, and here we have this fellow again, the, the wild man, sleeping calmly. Um, I, I met John in 1991. And there is quite a bit of territory in between these paintings and um, that we may not be covering today. He did an over-the-back series of, that addressed the angst of relationship, carrying women over his back, and also the sense of responsibility, familial responsibility, and taking care. He was a great caretaker. Um, and. Uh, so there was that series, and also he would do pastels and work them into huge landscapes. Um, so that was happening when I met John. And Phil Allen, who I mentioned before, always came to Maine. So John would come up after teaching at visual arts or um, mass art. Ooh, up and um, he'd spend a few weeks doing pastels on Deer Isle, Maine, and then he would go back to the studio and evolve them into studio paintings of landscapes. So let's pivot over here. Um, Stonington is a fishing town, a very hard driving fishing town. And there is gear left and right, buoys. Gustin had given John, um, <laughs> well, when Gustin died, Musa called John up and said, John, come and get this art supplies. The studio is full of it. And he couldn't, his heart wouldn't let him. And then when Musa died, Philip's wife, uh, um, Musa, the daughter, called John up and said, John, come. 
the studio beckons you, come and get art supplies. So we did. We went up to Woodstock, Vermont, and John picked out boxes and boxes of paint, and they said all different colors. And when we got home, he starts opening them up. They were all cadmium red. Um, so there are piles of red buoys around um, Stonington. And this was deeply inspirational because he had all this paint. Gustin, Gustin's paintings are based on cadmium red, which is quite a rare and expensive paint and hard to mine. Or um, I think he feared that Russia would cut off the mines of it and that he wouldn't be able to get this paint anymore. So he stockpiled it, Gustin did. Well, John started, this pastel kicked off a huge series of fabulous paintings, big paintings of, this is Peter's boat gear, Peter Spear, down at Carol Richards' place. And um, <laughs> Peter would arrange it at the end of the season on the wall. and. John started painting, doing pastels of it. And could you pull into this one? I mean, John did pastels like nobody else. They're very vigorous, muscular drawings in color. And um, very marked by, by Max Beckmann, for example. Beckmann always did these dark black lines around things. And John would open those lines and just um, let the color bleed in. I mean, he was, John Ember is a, one of America's great masters. And you'll find such superb teaching in all these paintings. The moves, I don't, they're, they're like nobody else. I mean, this is also very much influenced by Leger. So he would just take, he, he would take learnings Ran, not randomly, but throughout art history. There'd be a, a part that's Titian, and there's a part that's Leger, and there's a part that's Picasso. I mean, this is very Picasso-esque. So let's scroll over to this one. Um, this is called Periscope. It's 1994 to 1995. We were married in 92. Our son, Gabe, was born in 94. I think part of, you know, that was, John's father had died right before I met him. And uh, I think that continuing, um, that being a father very much came to the forefront with the death of his father. and. Um, and yet it's a huge adventure. You don't know how it's going to affect these long all-nighters of painting. And, um, so this was done in, as a prelude and after Gabe's birth. And the sensitivity of mark making, I'd like you to move in on some of these details. Um, oh, you can just feel the ode to painting in them. They are, it is so sensitively and lovingly touched, this painting. And yet it's like this huge ear to the world of, I don't think of it so much as a megaphone, as a hearing device, like being touched by what's out there. Um, this was very much a period of, um, of cubistic investigation of Picasso and Leger. I would say more than others. Yeah, I mean, this just whisper of chains holding each other and the ropes and the labyrinthine of the ropes and buoys here. They're precursors to a kind of ramble that you will find. Let's make a quick 
foray to this one, if you don't mind. Because you'll find these rhythms starting to establish themselves um, in John's paintings that you'll find in that rope pastel. Um, and they ramble, you'll, you'll find them everywhere. The kind of serpentine opening and shutting and weaving of paint. Um, this one has very much a Hartley sky, um, a total ode to Hartley there, who John adored and was introduced to at Cornell, where he went before BU. Um, Phil said that a Milton Avery was also a great uh, influence on John, which I don't see as much, but um, maybe in some of the flatness of uh, of those early archetypal ones. I'm just going to pivot to this one across the room. Um, Gabe obviously was a baby in a backpack on John's um, back. This is Eagle Island. At late afternoon on Eagle Island, he did not want to go on this island um, expedition. <laughs> and I begged him to. And this fabulous painting came out of it. Um, it he, John also worked from photographs. And he's one of the few people I know who can make working from photographs work for him. Like, he just will take information and then make it his and abandon the stuck quality that often inhabits painters working from photography. Um, it's very rhythmic. Yeah. It was not an easy, having a young child is exhausting. And um, you can kind of see it as well as exhilarating. And he, uh, he, was, he is a great father for the next 20 years. Um, and adored our son, Gabe. <laughs> and um, that whole theme of carrying and responsibility is very much present in this one in another form than the earlier ones. Of, it's a whole different kind of relationship. This is 1998, and you're starting to see a different kind of bounce and rhythm being established. You know, he's left the Cubistic series, which was a deep series. I mean, there's fabulous paintings from that series. Let's go to the next room. Um, We're going to start over here. This is Ireland. In 2002, John got a fellowship to Ballinglen Art Foundation in County Mayo. Um, at Bally Castle. And Ireland was a totally new experience for us. So Gabe was about six or seven, I think. He might have been 10. I don't know. Um, I could do the math, too. He was eight. Um, John had a high fever, totally, totally out of it. Um, but he determined to use his month-long fellowship to paint. And so he, with this raging fever, he'd go out onto the porch and he'd mix up big bowls of paint and he'd just s slam them in there. And it was a breakthrough into a different kind of abstract, a bend, very knowledgeable, but also abandon that he found extremely exciting. And you will see it reverberate from here on out. Um, 
This is the year before, interest, interesting to me. Um, this is 2001, so you can certainly see it starting to happen, these big brush strokes, small ones coming over, layers and layers of paint, he would flip them over. Um, he just wanted to surprise himself and be on that verge of out of control with supreme knowledge. Um, just inspiring himself, challenging himself, getting, giving him some, the struggle. He always talked about the fight, the struggle with the painting, and that seemed to be nothing really felt right unless he'd had that dynamic going on. Um, and the drawing, the, the big paint swaths and the drawing on top of that is also very Leger-like. So you can kind of see the threads coming through. We didn't talk about that landscape in there, but that's the same period. Um, I am going to ask you I'm kind of trying to do it consecutively, but one of the wonderful things about this show is it's not hung consecutively. And so um, I might as well delve into some of it while we're here. This is 2009. I was always planting gardens, uh, fl flowers, lilies, different garden flowers I thought would entice him because John was not a gardener, but um, he loved form, of course, and the lilies ended up being a theme that recurred flowers, tiger lilies, day lilies, um, nasturtiums, which we're going to look at soon. And it's very much about relationship, and it's very tender. His paintings, he started to become more and more comfortable with not overworking paintings, not making, I mean, the early ones weigh a ton. They are carcasses of paint. Um, when Gabe was born, John decided he would start to work on panels. So all three of these are panels. And um, the paint sits right up on the surface. It's not sucked in and absorbed as it is with, with canvas. Um, which was an exciting dynamic, and you can scrape it. Like a lot of these are scraped or sanded or um, really abused and brought back into this luscious quality. I mean, Gorky is another person. John loved Gorky, and of course, de Kooning, which circles back into his childhood. He and his father used to go and try to get into, they wanted to meet de Kooning. And they would get close, they would get to his studio and peer through the windows. Um, and he took me there once when he was showing me where, where he grew up and uh, it was a beautiful spread. But anyway, you're gonna see um, his hats off to de Kooning um, th threaded through. I think that they, those late de Koonings, well, the women too, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, I am going to pivot over to this side of the room, if you don't mind. Um, okay, come along. Um, he started from Ireland doing abstract landscapes always working from life. These are panels. Um, he would go out and respond on site to, um, and he had favorite spots. You know, he basically had two spots, windswept and muscle shoals. And um, they were both low tides. He, he preferred low tide. 
And this wonderful painting, I mean, just let's zoom in on this set of, he, he loved how a spatter and a, you know, he would just load up that brush with luscious, viscous paint and let it rip to get these beautiful sign painter, Gorky-esque or de Kooning splatters, certainly, you know, some of Pollock, but underneath there is this structure of the rocks and the low tide ledges and the distance and the space and um, Let's pivot over to here, this one. Um, this is Tiger Lilies, 2009. And if, I, I want you to see the whole, but I also want you to come in and just take a look at these raucous inventions of paint. And this is one that I was thinking is very much like de Kooning's women. Um, just in some sense savage and then moving up into this airy line that's just dreamlike and tender and floating with these, I think this one's on, yeah, gust and linen. Um, it was great linen. The mark making and the building up of paint underneath, it's very, you know, there are layers and layers. And this is a good example of the morphs that these paintings went through are fabulous. And I really wish, uh, I, I documented a lot of them in their progressions. And some I just went, oh, why don't you stop? Um, but, uh, it was very hard for him to stop. Towards the end, those panels get fresher and fresher. And he, um, so now we're moving back a little bit in time, I think. This is 2009, this is 2007, and it spanned a lot of years. John, how many years was this one? 1997 to 2007. Nine, so 10 years. And it isn't that he was working on it all the time. As with many painters, we live with the paintings and then you think, ah, that really bothers me. I think I'm just gonna make a tweak. And then you end up repainting the whole thing. And John was pretty notorious for that. Um, he, yeah, a lot of paintings were really repainted deeply. And this is one of them. Um, so it's quite a leap in two years from this to that. Um, here's another interesting leap. Um, one of John's touchstones was his uncle's place in upstate New York, Chatham. And he called it a vertical horizontal, Jackie's Hill. And it was this farmer, Jackie, and from, geez, early, early 80s, John started doing these huge oil paintings of this hillside. He'd be standing down here looking in, or he'd be standing here looking up, or standing here looking down. And it's a wonderful lifetime series. Someday I would like to see a show of just the hillsides um, in some museum. This is a two-year difference, I believe. And it goes from 2002 to 2004. And um, just the, you know, the lusciousness of the paint and just letting it build in this volatile kind of way and the, the road and he would usually go before we came to Maine, so that it would be spring or fall, and um, he'd make these pilgrimages. And this is an autumn one. Um, yeah. I, I'm gonna do the, I know we, uh, 
I want to look at the nasturtium and then come back to that one. Can we do that? Thank you. Um, in the fall, I would come up and do blueberry barrens, and John would stay home with Gabe, and I would bring him as an offering the last of the nasturtiums, and I'd bring them home. And um, nasturtiums last a long time in vases, and they're rambling, and I would bring long 10-foot trails of them. And uh, he, he had an affinity for, for nasturtiums. I think it's that rambling, it's the rope again, the labyrinthine. And this one feels very Asian to me in that, well, or very Bryce Marden quality to it. I, it's just a sumptuous painting that has both freshness and glazes and rubs out, he's rubbing out. So the whole paint quality has changed. And I think that the touch of the paint often led him into these new dialogues with image. There were those heavy mark makings of de Kooning, not de Kooning, um, Van Gogh earlier on, the portraits. They're little, they're small marks that are built up, you know, sometimes super thick. And now they're just very thin, rubbed, sanded, diaphanously rambled, and um, extremely eloquent and so tender. It's a magnificent, it's a masterpiece, I'd like you to know. Um, and then, so 2010, John started to experience, 2012, he, he was at the top of his form. I mean, he was flying. And uh, the windswepts are, long landscapes of ledges at one of his favorite places. And it's an extraordinary series of paintings. And he started feeling these vibrations through his body like it, that wouldn't stop. They were fasciculations and they would come up his arms and go across his chest and down the other arm. And he started to feel a weakness in his arms. So he went down to uh, Mount Auburn in Cambridge and uh, hospital and the doctor said, oh, you've got ALS. And he came back from that visit with this news and it was just, uh, it, Gabe had just gone to his first year of college at uh, Bates. Uh, you can imagine. So, this is at that point that Maine Masters, Dick Kane, started to film, thanks to Peggy Golden, who said, you know, Dick, if you're gonna do, John was on a list of people, prospective people to document, and she said, this is, this is your moment, you gotta do it. And Dick leapt right on it, and we fundraised, and people just poured in and gave the money to, to make it fly, and, uh, he entered it with incredible humor and buoyant, a kind of buoyant spirit that is remarkable. And you think this film is going to be sad. It is, he pour, if you want a great human film, art film, wisdom, he just poured it all in that film, everything. So Ember's Left Hand, you should check it out. And, um, I think it's on Amazon, or you can get it through Main Masters. You can Google it. Um, the painting got more and more um, rough, clumsy. He had to move to his left hand from his right. Um, and he kind of welcomed it. It was the struggle again. He just went for it. He did figure drawing. He taught at Harvard 
he taught for many years at Harvard um, figure drawing. And he would go in and, the, uh, you know, the students would help him set up the room and uh, he'd draw as well as paint. And he just thought those were the most splendid drawings he'd ever done. Um, they were distillations, so everything became a distillation. So let's, let's pivot back over here. And um, he did landscapes as long as he could. And then he started, our, um, we were lucky enough to be introduced to Ron Hoffman of Compassionate Care ALS. And Ron was a great guide through this period with ALS. And he said, you know, John, you're not going to have the energy to repeatedly be with people. You've got to conserve your energy. And so what John ended up doing was inviting people he wanted to say goodbye to, and he did portraits. And they generally took an hour and a half to two hour sessions. And every, every particle of his being was conserved for these sessions. And he couldn't raise his arms anymore, so the, um, the, the panels would be placed low on the easel. He had his assistants, Holly Mead and Adam and Chris Hasek. And, um, we had such support through this time of two communities of people, Deer Isle, and Cambridge, Somerville, you know, Boston, MIT. People just poured in to try to help him cope. And um, his, they were, they were comedy sessions, and here we are back to the vaudeville. I mean, he, he would just make people laugh, and yet at the same time, you can see the kind of deeply somber. People were so disturbed that they were losing this man that they loved. And um, at the top of his game, it was a heartbreak. And this is Aparna Agrawal and Peggy Golden and Bob Keyes, who came to do a really great article, human interest article. And um, down at the end is Lob Song, and we're probably going to end with that one as we tool back. But um, it was purely miraculous that with so little, the eloquence that came out in these paintings, and they were like x-ray visions of people's souls, kind of. And I've got to say, you know, art is like a religious experience for us artists and, and viewers. I mean, it really taps into something deeply spiritual and eternal, the need to make marks, and the kind of deep place you, you go into and merge with your activity or your environment, your work. You just, it's unknown territory and you go for it. And he did it right to the end. And he died days after he lost the ability. He had transitioned to headgear. He was doing a small series of botanicals and they're wonderful. They're so, uh, they're great little paintings. Um, but it was all coming from his neck. And his assistant's mother-in-law came to town and he, had, he, needed, he wanted to show her the town. They were from the south. And um, in that period of time, his neck seized up and that was it. So let's go down and see Lob Song because this is one of the last portraits he did. It's, it's near the end. And, um, this is a show you, you've got to see. It's one of the best painting shows of your lives, and um, I want you to see it. It's very, um, and it's an extraordinary space to see it in. 
thanks to the generosity of Kelly and John, and, um, and the perseverance and belief of Peggy Golden in John's work. Um, it, it's a space that does the work justice. So this is, um, Lob Song was a Tibetan priest who had retired from that, and he was helping people who were losing the ability to take care of themselves. And my body wasn't strong enough anymore to lift John. And uh, Lob Song had been recommended to us by some good friends. Yeah. And so it's, again, you can see Picasso, Leger, Beckman, this wonderful thought, dream up here. Um, and maybe we can pivot back, just do a span of that room again, um, back to that last self-portrait of John. But, um, the black and white, which is one last one I wanted to mention is based, it's of Gabe and a wheelbarrow at my mom's place, surrounded by his toys. And Gabe was really the love of John's life. I mean, uh. So it's a splendid show. I was too. Thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, we'd like to answer them. And uh, remember that there's a pause, so it may take us a while to listen to any. And you could just, yeah. Maybe you could, we could move down through the show as this happens. This may be an unfair question. Do yeah. you have a favorite period of John's work? Yeah, the last work. I mean, I just, I'm, I am, I love the last paintings. There's a lot of favorite paintings in this show. Um, but what he was doing at the end, um, you know, the last four, the last 10, let's say the last 10 years of his life, it's a very interesting period. And I just think, God, where would he have gone? But he arrived somewhere that is just so pure. I mean, he was so demanding of himself, always for a kind of excellence that um, it really shows up in those last 10 years. It, it's here, it's, it's totally present in all these paintings but my favorites are the last. Yeah, come on over here to these. These are the de Kooning, odes to de Kooning, who was a deep love of his. And, um, you know, I think, as I said, John moved back and forth through time of art history and brought it to the present. It, he reinvestigated it in the present and in, infused it in the present. And um, from these iconic ones, you know, Bonnard is so present in this one. Um, but this is just, he wanted to do a de Kooning. He, he wanted to address de Kooning. And it was a, a, a love he shared with his father and, all, and Phil and David DeSalvo. Um, and those late de Kooning's, oh, they're such beautiful paintings. And I feel like John approached that in the late work, um, his own form, which, which I love just as much as those late de Kooning's. Have any other questions? Uh, so Carl has a question. Um, you had talked about it a bit uh, with the Eagle Island 
painting of John and Gabe, um, and you talked a bit of sort of the responsibility and burden, and he had a question about it. He also sees um, some sadness in it, and if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I kind of touched on the sadness because, yeah. Um, having a child and how would it impact, how would being a parent and the deep connection of utter love and responsibility impact that total commitment to being an artist, which John and I really shared and understood in one another. Um, there is tremendous sadness in this one and a kind of almost, uh, well, exhaustion and, at and terror, like how is this going to affect my life as a painter for somebody who has been as deeply committed as he had been and as ambitious and driven to have a child that you just want to give your entire being to. And um, they had a, a very deep connection. It was a bridging time. And what follows this is the black and white series, which is literally a dark series. Um, and he's struggling with having the time to paint and feeling a little lost, I think. Not lost, because these are not lost paintings. But um, it's the end of life as he knew it and the beginning of something else. And he was not yet at the something else, but he could feel it happening. And I. John's work always has a deep tap connection, emotional connection. It's one of the things I treasure about this work is you can always feel him in it. Um, there is an emotional tap root, and it's certainly evident in this one. The, almost the ghost of his being is here. and. Um, He's so unarticulated and kind of merging with the environment. And I think that exhaustion of young parenthood, you know, it speaks to that, as well as a, a major transition in his work. And so I don't think I finished the story. He did start doing panel paintings on panel that were poke proof, so Gabe could bash into them and he wouldn't be like, oh, don't touch the painting. Um, and he, it was the end of these long, um, long sojourns of endless meditation on painting. And the paintings became, he would start and finish them in one session, primarily. And um, that opened up a whole other world of working. And in, in these major transitions, Obviously, we see a, a lot of transitions here in the show. Uh, how sudden were they versus sort of a gradual change? Mm -hmm. I think when he started to get bored, he had no toleration for knowing what he was doing. And he would open up art books you know, the, he, his art li book library is supreme. And um, there were books open to all the greats all the time. He'd be looking at what color combination am I looking at here? Maybe I'll try this. He, he would just look for stimulation to plunder. And, um, but he also needed to shake Gustin off, and he did that pretty, I think he, he did it well. Um, did I address that question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. 
second here. I think we're at the end of the question so far. Look at this rubbed out arm. <laughs> and the, you can just feel the total weight of the baby on his back. Hmm. Right. Can you yeah. talk a bit about that? Yeah. Transition. He really liked being with me, and um, <laughs> he wanted to be with me, and so I was. Uh, I liked plain, painting plein air. We had a lot of parallels. I've always done figurative narrative f since college, since before, and um, a as did he. It's funny how parallel and yet how different our work is. And so we understood that about each other. Um, in the summer, I work, summer and falls, I work outdoors solely and um, on location. So I was showing him all these different parts of the island and introducing him to the environment in some ways. He, he loved his early life, he did a lot of camping and traveling out west into, he went to college in Colorado and then in New Mexico and um, loved the great outdoors. By the time I met him, that part was sort of over. Um, I didn't think I'd ever get him out of Somerville. However, uh, I came with Maine, so um, that was, that became really good for him. Um, Maine was just fertile territory for John, um, and he really found his own way. And as I said, he had these two, these several favorite places. He liked to know where he was going to go, and he got infinite, they had infinite reservoirs for him. The latitude of what he got out of those places is extraordinary. Um, And I think probably, you know, that question of which are my favorite period, I paint quite thinly and transparently and with rub outs and that a kind of breathing. And I really respond to that part of his work, um, the kind of air being allowed to pulse through it. Um, though. I really, I mean, I love all these paintings, yeah. Shall we go over to John's self-portrait as a goodbye? And, um, Well, John, you left us with a lot of material to, uh, to revel in and to experience, and I surround myself with it, and I feel him so much through his art. Um, yeah. Hey, sweetheart. Yeah, that's it.